is the name above every name alpha omega the beginning and the end he as is let him hear his call let him hearken to these words he who is thirsty come freely drink of the waters of Yeshua HaMashiach Offspring of David Holy One of Let him hear his call, let him hearken to his word. He who is thirsty, come freely drink of the waters of Yeshua. of the waters of Yeshua. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, if anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. The Gospel of John, chapter 7, verses 37 through 39. Well, welcome once again to Wednesday Night Bible Study. My name is Carl Luther, and this is KDL Ministries. Rivers of living waters. That's what's inside of Jesus. And he promised us that if we believe in him, then out of our heart will flow rivers of living water too. It's sort of along the lines of like father, like son. Or as a pastor I heard preach this past Sunday, he said, Jesus came into this world to become like one of us so that we could become like him. And living waters are in Him, and living waters will be in us. Of course, those waters He spoke about was in reference to the Holy Spirit. And this concept of living waters ties in perfectly with our lesson tonight and our continued study in Gideon. So let's get right into it. Picking up from last week, Judges chapter 6, beginning in verse 25. Now it came to pass that same night that the Lord said to Gideon, 
Take your father's young bull, the second bull of seven years old, and tear down the altar of Baal that your father has, and cut down the wooden image that is beside it, and build an altar to the Lord your God on top of this rock in the proper arrangement. And take the second bull and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the image that you shall cut down. Now that's where we left off last week. Continuing. So Gideon took ten men from among his servants and did as the Lord had said to him. But because he feared his father's household and the men of the city too much to do it by day, he did it by night. Now I've heard it said that Gideon didn't trust God and that he feared man above God because of that last verse. And I find this all the time with many preachers for whatever reason. They just love to criticize Old Testament men of God whom Jesus only spoke good of. Men like Abraham and Noah and even Moses. I'd say walk in their shoes and see if you could do any better. Or better yet, listen to what God said concerning Moses. Let's look at the book of Numbers chapter 12 beginning verse 6. Then God said, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I the Lord make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses, he is faithful in all my house. I speak with him face to face, even plainly and not in dark sayings, and he sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? So teachers and preachers beware before you armchair quarterback any of God's men whom the Bible only speaks favorably of. And in this case with Gideon, understand that Gideon followed God's direction to the T. Everything he was supposed to do at the exact same time that God said to do it, he did. Well, Carl, it says that Gideon didn't tear down the altar of Baal during the daytime, but rather he did it by night. Well, that's exactly right. Recall when this story is taking place? Now, it came to pass that same night that the Lord said to him, Take your father's young bull, the second bull of seven years old, and tear down the altar of Baal that your father has, and cut down the wooden image that is beside it. So even though Gideon may have had some reservations about doing this deed in broad daylight, as in the next morning, he actually followed God's direction 100% and did it the exact same night that God told him to do it. But honestly, Gideon had good reason for concern. Listen to the townspeople's reaction. Continuing, picking up verse 28. And when the men of the city arose early in the morning, there was the altar of Baal torn down. And the wooden image that was beside it was cut down, and the second bull was being offered on the altar which had been built. So they said to one another, Who has done this thing? And when they inquired and asked, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, has done this thing. Then the men of the city said to Joash, Bring out your son that he may die, because he has torn down the altar of Baal, and because he has cut down the wooden image that was beside it. So actually, Gideon's concern for doing this in broad daylight had good merit. I like to say that Gideon was street smart. Continuing, picking up in verse 31. But Joash said to all who stood against him, Would you plead for Baal? Would you save him? Let the one who would plead for him be put to death by morning. If he is a god, let him plead for himself, because his altar has been torn down. So here's just some cultural information to better understand Joash's boldness. It was common knowledge in pagan worship that you never interfered with the actions of the supposed gods. To take up for a god, as in this case, would have brought dishonor to the gods. That's why Joash was able to speak so boldly to the townspeople who were in such an uproar. He reminded the people that if Baal was a god, then let him take up for himself. And if anyone takes up for Baal, let him be put to death. Continuing, picking up verse 32. Therefore on that day he called him Jerobel, saying, Let Baal plead against him, because he has torn down his altar. So who called who Jerobel? Joash the dad called his son Gideon Jerobel. So here's a really cool understanding. Gideon's name means warrior, and his dad began, began to call Gideon Jerobel. 
which means Baal will contend with. So when you combine the meaning of those two names, you actually come out with a man who's called the Demon Slayer. And here's how I come to that conclusion. If Baal is a demon who's fighting against Gideon, and Gideon's name means warrior, and God already said that Gideon would defeat the Midianites as one man, then that would mean that Gideon would defeat Baal too. So in my book, Gideon is a demon slayer. How about that for some extracurricular insight? And yes, you may want to read over all that again just in case I lost you. But continuing, let's pick up in verse 33. Then all the Midianites, the Amalekites, the people of the east, they gathered together and they crossed over and camped in the valley of Jezreel. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. Then he blew the trumpet and the Abizrites gathered behind him. And he sent messengers through all Manasseh, who also gathered behind him. He also sent messengers to Asher, Zebulun, Naphtali, and they all came up to meet them. Now the word trumpet here is actually the word shofar, but there were trumpets in Old Testament Israel as well as shofars. Both had their own unique purposes. Trumpets were basically used to call for an assembly. For example, trumpets were blown as a call for worship. They were blown on every Sabbath day and on each new moon and on every one of the seven annual feast days. And in the wilderness years, the trumpets were blown as a call to move camp whenever the pillar of smoke and the pillar of fire lifted up from the Holy of Holies. But the shofar was a more ominous sound. It was used as a call for war. Remember at Jericho, shofars were blown, blown when the walls came crashing down. The shofar was also blown in conjunction with trumpets on the Feast of Trumpets. But here in our story, look what's taking place. A great battle was about to ensue. So the Spirit of God came upon Gideon and he sounded the shofar as a call for battle. And don't just gloss over that phrase, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. When this happened in Old Testament saints, they were able to do superhuman feats. If you remember in our first study, when we first started studying judges, we saw certain judges of Israel kill multiple enemy warriors single-handedly because the Spirit of God came upon them. Of course, the most well-known story is that of Samson. But there was also Elijah the prophet, which is a story years ahead of where we're at now. But it was said that he outran a man riding a horse-pulled chariot. So just stop and think about the power that resides in us. The Holy Spirit of God doesn't just come upon us. He dwells within us. And I don't think the average Christian, including myself, understands completely the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells in us. But that would have to be a completely different study. But one thing I do believe that's very important to understand here, and that is when the word says, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, the word came is the, word, is the Hebrew word labash, which means to wrap around as in putting on a covering or a garment. So the Spirit of God is wrapped around Gideon like a garment of sorts. Just ponder that as we continue. So in our story, the Spirit of the Lord came upon or was wrapped around Gideon and he picked up the shofar and blew it as a call for battle. Now, for a moment, I want you to stop and consider what all's just taken place. Within the last few verses of this chapter, Gideon has gone from being under the authority of his father's house, most likely just as involved in compromise as everybody else by worshiping Baal and Asherah. I mean, we just saw the altar of Baal and the image of Asherah right there in his dad's own front yard, right? So Gideon, while he was still yet a sinner, just like us before God sent his son Jesus to atone for our sins, God came to Gideon. Then we see Gideon offer a sacrifice which was accepted by God as it was consumed by fire on that rock. Gideon then destroyed the altar of Baal and the image of Shira. And then all of a sudden, the Spirit of God came upon him and he blew the shofar and sounded a call for battle. This man Gideon, whose clan was weakest of all Manasseh who was, and who was the least of his father's own household, became a new man. He who is least shall be called greatest. Now, I'm pretty sure Jesus said something along those lines, right? And the steps that Gideon took to get him from point A to point B is very similar to our own story. God came to us while we were yet still sinners. Isn't that what Paul said? 
Let's look at it. Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. Then there was a sacrifice that was consumed and accepted by God. Speaking of Jesus' crucifixion. Let's look at that. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 12 through 14. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God from that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstools. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Then we, like Gideon, are called to destroy those pagan altars and practices in our own heart, practices that God detests. And then the Spirit of God comes inside of us. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 5, verses 5 through 8. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you were once in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. The steps that transformed Gideon and made him into the leader that he was becoming are the same steps that we take when we come to Christ. And now this same man that God appeared to and has now been converted is the same man that God will use to deliver Israel. And look at the proof. All these men from the tribes of Manasseh and Asher and Zebulun and Naphtali, they all answered his call for battle. And God will use Gideon to deliver Israel from the many nights. But even through all of this, Gideon's flesh still got in the way. His spirit was willing, but his flesh was weak. And what do I mean by that? Well, recall what I just said earlier. Gideon was becoming a great leader, but he's not quite there yet. Let's read the story about the fleece and let's get some understanding. Picking back up in verse 36, Judges chapter 6, beginning in verse 36. So Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, Look, I shall put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece only, and it is dry all on the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And it was so, when he rose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece together, he wrung the dew out of the fleece, a bowlful of water. Then Gideon said to God, Do not be angry with me, but let me speak just once more. Let me test, I pray, just once more with the fleece. Let it now be dry only on the fleece, but on the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night. It was dry on the fleece only, but there was dew all on the ground." So Gideon's flesh got in the way. This testing of God was a very immature thing to do. And as I mentioned last week, this story is so misrepresented by so many Christians. Have you ever heard someone say, I'm going to throw out the fleece to find out what God's will is on a certain matter? Just because this is what Gideon did and God answered doesn't make it right. And in a moment, we'll discuss the hidden golden nugget of truth that was behind this story and what this story actually pointed towards and why God allowed it. But you need to understand this. To say you're going to throw out the fleece like Gideon did to see what God's will is concerning a matter is so wrong on so many different levels. And why? Well, for starters, Gideon knew what God's will was. This test, unknowing to Gideon, pointed towards something much larger than Gideon's weakness. And like I said, God's will was already made plain and clear to Gideon. He just couldn't get past the reality that God chose him to lead Israel. But we are to never test God like that. And the scriptures make this very clear. Let's review it just to make sure. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at Massa. Well, Carl, that's just Old Testament stuff that passed away and we no longer have to consider it. Well, tell that to Jesus. That's one of the laws that supposedly passed away that the perfect Son of God used as a weapon against Satan. Remember? Let's look at Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 5. 
Then the devil took him to Jerusalem, the holy city, and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up on their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, It is also written, and forever remains written, you shall not test the Lord your God. So to test God like Gideon did is out of the question. And sadly, that's what many Christians get out of this story of Gideon and the fleece. But as I said earlier, Gideon was still in the making. He was still becoming the leader that God would use. So I don't ridicule Gideon at all. I mean, are we any different? Has God ever directed you for an assignment and your spirit was willing but your flesh was weak? I think that's exactly what happened to Jesus' own disciples. Let's refer to that story so I can make my point. And in this story, we find Jesus is about to be handed over to Pontius Pilate, where he would be mangled and beyond recognition and then be crucified on the cross. And you know what? Jesus didn't want to go. He knew the agony and torture that he was about to endure. He also knew the sins of the entire world were about to be placed right on his shoulders. So he prays to his heavenly Father. Let's read about it. Matthew chapter 26, beginning in verse 36 through 41. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. And he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther and fell on his face, and he prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping, and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So my point is this. There's always a growing process for us all. With these disciples of Jesus, their spirit was wanting to do what was right. But because they had not spiritually matured yet, their flesh was still weak. So weak that they couldn't even stay awake and pray with Jesus. And in our story with Gideon, even though he saw some amazing events take place over the past 24 to 48 hours, when it came time for battle, his flesh became weak. So what did Gideon do? He tested God. And God answered Gideon's test twice. Now, I told you there was a huge golden nugget of truth behind this story, right? And perhaps this was the reason why God allowed Gideon to test him and why he answered Gideon the way he did. In God's infinite wisdom, when we are weak, He is what? He is strong. With Gideon being weak in the flesh, God showed up strong in this story by giving us a picture of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Would you like to hear it? Well, what animal does a fleece come from? Its wool comes from a lamb. And Jesus came into this world as the Lamb of God. And guess what? The world was dry. Speaking of God's Spirit, the world was dry as a desert. And you know what? King David even makes my point. This is what he says. Let's look at Psalms chapter 63, verse 1. O oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. But within Jesus, per our opening scripture, there are rivers of what? Living water. The living waters of life were inside of Jesus. Now, the Spirit of God is always associated with several things. Oil being one, fire being another, and what else? You got it, water. And Jesus was full of the Spirit of God. Here's an Isaiah prophecy that declared this to be true of Jesus some 700 years before he's even born. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 11, beginning verse 1 through 2. And there shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, 
the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. So clearly the spirit of God dwelt within Jesus. And what was Gideon's first test? Water was to be on the fleece, but the ground all around was to be dry. And so it was with Gideon's first test. The fleece was wet and the ground was dry. And so it was with Jesus. When he came into this world as the Lamb of God, he was full of living waters. But the ground, as David said, it was a dry and thirsty land where there was no water. Now then, as we read, Gideon still had doubts, and so God used Gideon's weakness again to show us strength again. And what was the second test? Well, it was just the opposite of the first test. The fleece was to be dry and the ground all around it was to be wet with water. Well, what happened when Jesus died on the cross? When the sins of the world were placed on Jesus, for the first time in his life, he felt the rejection of God. And not only the rejection of God, but the entire rage of God's fury and wrath because of my sins and your sins. The wrath that we deserved was poured out on Jesus. He cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And what happened when the soldier pierced Jesus' side? Blood and water flowed out from his body. The water of life fell down onto a dry desert ground, only to give way to the day of Pentecost some 50 days later, where God's Holy Spirit was made available for all those who believe. Out of your heart will flow rivers of living water, just like Jesus said. And on the day of Pentecost, spiritually, the dry ground got saturated. Gideon was weak in the flesh. But God used his weakness to declare the greatest story ever told. But it was hidden. It was a story cloaked in a parable of sorts, so only those who have ears to hear and eyes to see can hear it and see it and have this hope. Hmm, can you say, I think we just found the story of Jesus once again in the Old Testament? And don't miss this, Gideon was wrapped up in this story literally. When the Spirit of God, Labash, when he came upon Gideon, God used Gideon's fleece to hide the mystery of Christ within the story that we all just read. This fleece would have been later fabricated into a coat or a mantle or some form of outer garment. The symbolism of the Spirit of God labashing or wrapping himself like a garment around Gideon and then hiding the mystery of Christ within a piece of fabric destined to become a garment, that's just mind-boggling. But that's just what God will do. He will turn our weakness into strength. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. God used Gideon's weakness to show himself strong and to hide within this story the greatest story ever told. It always, it always points towards Jesus. And that's the hidden truth of Gideon's fleece. I hope you all learned not only something new tonight, but something that you can take and apply to your own life. Until next time, stay safe, and I'll see you all next week. Is this life?